taking down of the Russian plane by Turkey on the most outrageous, um, with the most outrageous uh, excuse, clearly premeditated. And look at where we are now, because there's different levels of this. And deep, deep in the rabbit hole, where the hidden hand is well beyond the, the knowledge of at least most of these players, they have the very circumstances that I've been talking about all these years for the start of World War Three. They have now, on one side, the United States, the rogue state of Turkey. They have France. And, of course, Cameron is desperately now and seems to be getting support from these idiotic Labour MPs who won't listen to the common sense of their leader. They want Britain bombing in there as well. So there you have NATO. And what is the plan to pitch NATO against Russia and China? So you have Russia now in Syria with warplanes and they're bringing more um, high-tech, state-of-the-art equipment in as a result of the downing of this plane. They're also supported, as sad is, by China. And it was, the plan was and is for a third world war involving NATO against Russia and China. And also in there is another target on the list, Iran supporting Assad. So you have this powder keg situation that has miraculously unfolded as I've been talking about it would in the light of their plans for years and years. It's unfolded like this because it's all been planned from the start. And, of course, the demonization of Russia started with Ukraine. Ukraine was um, subjected to the latest United States organized coup to remove an elected leader. Not a nice man. No, how many of them are? But an elected leader. And in was put this guy, Poroshenko. WikiLeaks have um, revealed um, communications showing that he was an insider for the United States in Ukraine for years and years before. So they put their man in and they start the demonization of uh, Russia. And um, that's been followed by what's happened since. Do you know who orchestrated the, the uh, coup and the handing over of power to America's man in Ukraine? A lady called Victoria Newland, assistant um, secretary for European and Eurasian affairs at the U.S. State Department. Do you know who her husband is? Robert Kagan, co-founder of the project for the new American century. It's a movie. And you Labour MPs better get your fricking asses in gear. Start using some brain cell activity. Start doing some bloody research. And realize that you are being had again, not by a new war, but by the continuation of the same war on human freedom and human liberty. 
And you know, we've had Blair, Labour Party, does what he did. Now we have his opponent, whoa, Debbie Cameron, Conservative Party, doing exactly the same, continuing the same script. In America, we had George Bush, Republican, did what he did. And now we have President Obama, Democrat, opponent, whoa, doing the same. You know why nothing changes except that? Because they're all masks on the same face. And when that penny drops human race, we might have a chance of sorting this out. So, let's look at some detail and different elements of this. Um, Jeremy Corbyn, leader of the Labour Opposition Party, faces threat of shadow cabinet resignations. Or well, like I say, good bloody riddance. Uh, because if you've not got the intelligence to see what is happening, you should not be in politics because you are um, in dereliction of duty of protecting those who put you into office. Um, and this is going to move along in the next few days to see what happens. But you see, the thing is, we've had this new leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn. I don't agree with everything he says. I don't agree with everything he does. But he, he's got decent values. He's a decent man, which, which is a, a hell of a start in politics, considering what you normally get. And he doesn't want more bombing in Syria. But apart from him, who was brought in because he was elected by members, not the, the MPs. Apart from him and the few people around him, the rest of the Labour Party opposition is just the Conservative Party under another name. It's a one party state, just like. America is, and that is why they are talking about voting with the Conservative Party to send planes into Syria. Um, Obama supports Turkey after it shot down Russian jet. Here we have a country that has um, at most claimed, as the most it claims at all, that a Russian plane entered its airspace for 17 seconds, like I say, the Russians say they didn't at all, and they shot it down. Now, by any criteria, that is madness. And had Syria done that to a Turkish plane, then all hell would be breaking loose now. But this is how it works. It's not about whether something is right or wrong. It's whether it serves your agenda or it doesn't. When, whether the people involved are on your side or whether they aren't. Which is why um, Saudi Arabia, who are on the side of the cabal, can do what the hell they like. Same with Bahrain. Terrorism of extraordinary levels. And not a word is ever said by these Moral psychopaths. And so, of course, Obama and NATO were not going to come out and say, actually, Turkey, that was bloody out of order. No way. He's on our side. Of course he was all right, no matter what he did. Obama supports Turkey after it shot down Russian jet. U.S. President um, Barack Obama speaks during a joint press conference with French President France, uh, Francois Hollande at the White House. He expressed um, U.S. support for Turkey after it shot down the Russian warplane and said Ankara has the right to defend its airspace. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, you know, either they're idiots or um, they think we are. Probably a bit of both. 
um, but some of us try not to be. Eh? Turkey, like every country, has a right to defend its territory and its airspace, the puppet said. It's important right now to make sure the Russians and Turks are talking to each other to figure out what happened. Well, you know what happened. It was premeditated. It's part of this whole deal I'm describing. Oh, NATO. They support Turkey. Of course they do. Even though it is um, a country without which ISIS would probably not exist. And um, a country that is um, increasingly um, terrorizing its people and particularly its media. Turkey supports, uh, supported by NATO. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, see my books, um, has um, expressed the Western military alliance's support for Turkey after an emergency meeting of all the 28 members requested by Ankara over the incident. Um, as we have repeatedly made clear, Stoltenberg said, reading from his script, we stand in solidarity with Turkey and support the territorial integrity of our NATO ally. Of course, there's this thing about NATO, that if one is attacked, then they, 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 it, in effect, they, they're all attacked and they all have to support the one that's been attacked. And that is the process through which they want this Third World War to break out. Um, the NATO chief called on the governments of Russia and Turkey to exercise restraint. Well, a bit bloody late. This is an interesting story. I'm not, I'm not saying it's true, but this is certainly the kind of thing that happens. Um, in the Arab media, information is in circulation that the plan to destroy the Russian aircraft was clearly spelled out between the leaders of the US and Turkey. It was reported in particular by uh, Garesa News. According to the newspaper, um, President uh, er Erdogan um, allegedly um, received support from US President Barack Obama with a plan to shoot down the aircraft of the Russian Federation on the border with Syria. The compromising information in the Arab media was received from a source in the presidential administration in the United States, it says. Also, reports in the Arab media stated that the moment for the um, decision to um, attack the plane was taken by Obama and Erdogan at uh, the summit of G20 in um, Antalya, which, of course, immediately, literally immediately, followed the terrorist outrage in Paris, just as the 7-7 bombings in um, London took place at the time of the G8 in Glen Eagle, Scotland. So it could um, be, as I said last week in the video cast, be milked um, to, um, to justify further um, action on the on the script. Erdogan will continue shooting down violating planes. Of course, he ain't got to shoot down many more before Russia's going to be physically retaliating. And then where do we go? Turkey will open fire on foreign planes violating Turkish airspace in the future. President um, Erdogan um, um, warned amid a diplomatic crisis caused by the downing of the Russian warplane. If another violation of our aerial border happens, um, we can respond in the same way, said the genetic idiot. Um, the plane was shot down within the rules of engagement announced earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Putin has said, we still haven't heard any apologies from the leadership of Turkey, nor have we heard any proposal to compensate damages or hold those responsible for these um, heinous crimes to um, to account um, and it says the um, aggravating the rift is uh, between the two is um, the death of um, two Russian troops in the incident the pilot of the down jet was gunned down by fighters of a Turkey supported militant group the moderate um, the moderate rebels um, as he was parachuting to the ground and a Marine was killed when a Russian helicopter sent to rescue the crew came under fire um, from the ground. Um, and um, Moscow is saying that um, Turkey is shielding terrorist forces in Syria. Well, some of us have been pointing that out for a very, very long time with the goal of continuing to smuggle oil across the border. I'll come to that. Turkey's actions are de facto protection of Islamic State uh, the Russian Prime Minister um, said Wednesday. 
Um, this is no surprise considering the information we have about the direct financial interest of some Turkish officials um, relating to the supply of oil products refined by plants controlled by ISIS. One of um, the biggest forms of income of ISIS is selling oil from um, locations they've taken over and to do that they need the support of Turkey um, and of course Saudi Arabia and, and others and that's exactly what they've got. Um, and then, you know, I'm not saying that this third world war is going to break out tomorrow. Um, but we are now very much more uh, close to it um, than we were before. And the ante is being upped. Um, this is a story of the Russian response. World class um, S-400 service to air missile system deployed in Syria. Um, Russia defense minister has announced that the Russian Air Force base at uh, Latakia um, will now be supported with these um, SAM systems after the unprecedented act of aggression it says exhibited by Turkey. Um, he also announced the following enhancements to the Russian mission in Syria that are sure to generate anger from Turkey and um, NATO. One, all Russian bombers will now be escorted by uh, Russian fighter jets that will be able to repel any further air to air attacks see that the the, um, the potential for this plan to play out um, in the current circumstances is now massive um, two guided Russian missile cruisers have been deployed off the coast to provide long-range anti-air support and all military to military contact with Turkey has been suspended uh, these um, um, SAM uh, missile systems it says are truly world class it has a range of 400 kilometers and is capable of destroying tactical aircraft strategic aircraft cruise missiles and ballistic uh, missiles the whole thing is is moving so fast as a result of what's happened uh, another story about the Russians uh, yeah, mentioned there deploying a, a missile cruiser off Syria um, that will target um, threats and then there's uh, sanctions uh, by Russia on Turkey. Uh, Russia is preparing wide-ranging economic sanctions against Turkey over the, over the, the plane um, attack. And the uh, Prime Minister has said the measures will be drafted within days and could hit joint investment plans. Um, speaking at a televised cabinet meeting in Moscow, he said the government has uh, been ordered to work out a system of response measures to this act of aggression in the economic and humanitarian spheres. He said the focus would be on introducing limits or bans on Turkish economic interests in Russia and a limitation of supply of products, including food. And he said tourism, transport, trade, labor and customs, as well as humanitarian contacts would be affected. This is a point, actually. Um, the biggest um, foreign source of foreign tourists in Turkey, which is, of course, massively important to their economy, is from Russia. And um, what you, you are seeing with these various incidents and terrorist attacks is the, I would say, systematic destruction of the tourist um, trade in the Middle East um, because they want to destroy it not just militarily, they want to destroy it economically. And the more that the economies collapse, the more there, more people will want to head for Europe in desperation. Uh, so what you've ha had, for instance, is this incident is obviously going to dramatically affect the tourist industry of Turkey. Then you have um, the plane taken down, the Russian plane, um, a, a tourist plane in Egypt which is, of course, dramatically going to affect the tourist industry in Egypt. And, of course, you had the um, grotesque terrorist attack on the tourists, the British tourists, um, on the Tunisian beach at a tourist hotel. Um, how many people are going to be going back to Tunisia for a holiday now? It... There are so many levels of this, and um, 
I've just finished a book, which is about to go to the printers. Um, should be out early in the, very early in the new year, which kind of explains how this um, this whole thing can play out in such detail, how it's done, and you have to go real deep in the rabbit hole for that. Then um, it's a strange story of uh, running on RT this week mystery over who bombed Turkish convoy allegedly carrying weapons to militants in Syria now Turkey has been the conduit for supplying ISIS um, all along like I say it couldn't really exist without Turkey um, and this story says footage released online by the Istanbul based humanitarian relief foundation the IHH shows plumes of smoke from the burning trucks and people running about in panic. At least 20 trucks were engulfed in flames. This is after the um, Russian plane was taken down. The mission, however, wasn't sponsored or organized by IHH, the group said. No organization has yet confirmed that the convoy belonged to them. Our teams helped to extinguish the fire. The trucks um, do not belong to us and there's no information on who bombed them. Uh, an official uh, uh, of the group said at least seven people were killed and 10 injured in the incident, according to um, the Turkish uh, agency, news agency. Uh, the trucks were reportedly heading to a town of uh, Azaz in northwest um, Syria. Since the news emerged, uh, media has been furiously speculating about who was behind the attack, what the trucks were transporting, what the convoy's humanitarian mission was. So much um, support and supplying of these um, terrorist groups is done under the, the cover of humanitarian aid um, or, or maybe it was carrying a more sinister uh, a more sinister load um, than humanitarian aid it says here um, one of the aid workers who survived the incident said the trucks had been deliberately targeted Reuters said uh, the nature of the humanitarian aid is also in question. Turkish media and the IHH uh, say the trucks were transporting humanitarian aid to refugees in Azaz. However, the Turkish, a Turkish newspaper cited sources close to the Syrian government saying the convoy was delivering weapons to terrorist organizations. Um, the Hawa news agency reported that Turkey repeatedly sent convoys with arms to the Al Nusra Front, the affiliate of Al Qaeda and other terrorist organizations under the guise of humanitarian aid. Reports on Twitter went further. They identified the arms as allegedly docker machine guns and small arms with ammunition. In the wake of the recent downing of the Russian jet uh, over Syria by Turkish uh, fighter jets, some reports suggest the Russians were avenging the pilot's, pilot's death. Many media outlets thought it was the work of um, Vladimir uh, Putin. Now, here's another aspect to this. You know, Russia is obviously, you know, in, in the in the focus at the moment. But China also has people in there. And um, something else happened amid all the furore uh, over the downing of the jet. And that's that a, a Chinese hostage was killed um, or reported to have been killed by ISIS this week. And the Chinese government says, in effect, we'll be striking against them. Now, China has it's people in um, Syria um, supporting Assad and so does Iran so you have this like I say the, the lineup planned for the third world war is all in that little area which is um, about the size of Washington state and this is a story Iran quietly deepens involvement in um, Syria's war and you know, it's kind of interesting that they're on that list and we've had this um, agreement after all that kind of stuff about Iran's nuclear weapons program. Um, we suddenly had this, this agreement out of nowhere and that's kind of gone away, but it's still on the list for regime change and takeover. Um, and um, if this unfolds in the way that it's going at the moment, and we, of course, I hope it doesn't, um, then Iran gets pulled into the fold through that means rather than um, what was going on before with the so-called so-called nuclear weapons program. Um, uh, a furore um, led by um, Israel that has a massive nuclear weapons program that America never talks about. Um, 
He says here, the new offensive launched by Syrian government forces in the countryside south of Aleppo has shed light on Iran's growing role in Syria's civil war. Officially, Iran denies it has deployed any combat troops in Syria, but a week before the offensive began, it was reported that hundreds of Iranian troops had arrived in Syria in preparation for an imminent assault on rebel-held areas. Um, Iran also announced the deaths of four high-ranking officers from the Islamic Revolution Guard Corps. Uh, cause, rather. And um, at least one of them, uh, Brigadier General Hossein Hamedi Dani, um, the most senior Iranian military officer to have been killed so far in the conflict, lost his life near Aleppo. Um, according to Iranian media, 18 high-ranking Iranian officers have been killed in Syria in the past three years, but the killing of four in just one week, particularly one just before a major offensive, implies that Iran may be more involved in the war than has been previously acknowledged. Iranian commanders, or several of them, have also warned that they would take revenge on the terrorists who killed um, the general, uh, Hami Adani, um, suggesting the force might have troops on the ground in Syria. Iranian officials have so far um, uh, said that the most significant contribution to the defense of President Assad has been the creation of the paramilitary national defense forces, which now had 100,000 fighters. And um, the, the, uh, the general who was killed has uh, said that 130,000 militiamen and women um, were ready to go to Syria if necessary. You can see it building here. Um, and um, it says here, he, he ran's foes um, may worry that um, the, um, the, the, the troops uh, may also uh, be feeling emboldened by the results of the troops and the government, by the results of the recent nuclear deal which paves the way for lifting of sanctions likely benefiting the force with a source of fresh funds. But that's just just part of the script, part of the game. Um, there is still the goal of doing to Iran what has been done to Syria, Libya, Iraq, and so on. U.S. deploys dozens of ground troops in Syria, the um, United States has deployed dozens of ground troops to Syria, claiming that it will assist Kurdish forces, any excuse will bloody do, um, in their battle against uh, Daesh, ISIS, terrorists, sources say. The so-called Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said on Thursday that 30 US soldiers arrived in the northern city of Kobani over the last two days, um, AFP reported. Actually, you'll find it's far more than 30. And this Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, I bloody love it. All the mainstream media are quoting this, right? As um, a source of news about what's going on in um, Syria. And um, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights that's telling the media, therefore telling people what's happening in Syria, is based in Coventry. And it's one man who hates Assad with a vengeance. He sits in his house in Coventry in the English Midlands, pouring out information about what's going on in Syria, all of which is anti-Assad. And they, it, because, oh, it's the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, one bloke with a massive axe to grind. Um, and uh, it goes on, US officials have told the Associated Press that Russia has directed parts of its military campaign against US-backed militants and other extremist groups in an effort to weaken them. Yes, because um, they know, the Russians know, that all those moderate rebels have just been created to um, remove Assad, including um, ISIS, and therefore, if you don't deal with them, you don't stop what's going on. And um, Syria has been gripped. Here's some figures for you. Syria has been gripped by foreign-backed militancy since March 2011. The crisis has claimed the lives of more than 250,000 people in a land the size of Washington State and displaced millions of others. So, we have 
boots on the ground, American boots on the ground, while um, Obama is saying there won't be boots on the ground. What will there be? Well, there'll be some booties, some trainers. There won't be any boots. Um, and uh, boots on the ground and a full-out war is, is what the plan wants. And it's another one. Don't rule out British boots on the ground in Syria, says William Hague. This bloke was the former foreign secretary. Uh, a very uh, strange man who um, always reminds me of a little boy in short trousers whenever I see him. British authorities should not exclude the possibility of sending ground troops to Syria if they want to defeat Islamic State. Former foreign secretary William Hague has suggested, close associate of Cameron, um, in a piece for the Telegraph, he argues the extremist group, what's he talking about, British government, American government, Turkey, what's he talking about? Oh, ISIS, oh, okay. Um, the extremist group, which controls swathes of Syria and Iraq, cannot be destroyed without boots on the ground. That military presence should be Syrians, Iraqis or other Arabs, but it would be a mistake for Britain or Western nations to rule out some of our own forces operating there if that can make the crucial difference to the outcome. Um, Haig served as Foreign Secretary between 2010 and 2014. He was involved in all the destruction in, in um, Libya. He said the case for military operations in Syria is very different to that of Iraq uh, in 2003. You must be joking, mate. Um, and um, he said the long overdue Chilcot report um, into the Iraq war will be a time to acknowledge that we were wrong about the invasion of Iraq but we're all right now it's always well we've learned our lessons mistakes were made in the past but structures have been put in place to make sure it doesn't happen again now we're going to do it again ah oh God, the world is insane. Um, now, this is interesting. Um, Haig, former Foreign Secretary, suggests one solution to the ongoing conflict would be to partition Syria and Iraq. The borders of Syria and Iraq uh, were largely drawn by two British and French diplomats in 1916. He writes, they should not be considered um, immutable. If the leaders of either country cannot construct a state where all communities can live together, it might be right to consider international support for their partition. Uh, Kurds have shown their ability to run their own affairs. A subdivided Syria might now be the only one that can be at peace. It just so happens that the Zionists and Israel have the concept of the greater Israel which is the land um, from the Nile in Egypt across to the Euphrates in Iraq. And part of that greater Israel plan is to partition Iraq and Syria. Now, oh God, White House gave ISIS 45 minute warning before bombing oil tankers. Now, um, as I said, the United States has not been trying to defeat ISIS in Syria. It created it. Don't want to defeat it. Well, make a bomb here and there, make a loud noise, or we're fighting ISIS. But, of course, they haven't been because they don't want to. And, and here's a classic story. Um, why did it take 15 months for the U.S. to target the Islamic State's oil infrastructure? Well, the reason is because that's where it gets much of its money from, thanks to Turkey and others. But the soon as um, Putin and Russia went in, they started bombing the oil infrastructure of ISIS. So, of course, um, the Americans were embarrassed into doing the same, but as little as possible. That's what this story is about. It just it, it took, oh dear. The Obama White House is giving ISIS a 45 minute warning before bombing their oil tankers by dropping leaflets advising potential jihadists to flee before airstrikes in Syria. Get out of your trucks now and run away from them, the leaflets say. 
warning, airstrikes are coming, oil trucks will be destroyed, get away from your oil trucks immediately, do not risk your life, the leaflet reads. The leaflet drops are justified under the premise that the oil tanker drivers might be civilians and not ISIS recruits, although it's an explanation that doesn't wash with critics. Well, killing civilians has never um, uh, troubled them before, and of course, these oil tanker drivers are connected to ISIS. Um, and it says here, it's not like these drivers are innocent, uninvolved civilians like children or sick people, writes J.E. Dyer in, a, in an article. They're waging ISIS's war, just like the other non-uniform participants who make up 100% of ISIS's ranks. This is how far the Obama administration is going to avoid collateral damage. And who knows, it might be worse. <clears throat> Front page mag's Daniel Greenfield makes a similar point, commenting, so after the, all this time, they came up with a great plan. Drop flyers on ISIS trucks so that the drivers who may or may not be ISIS members can run away in time. Meanwhile, ISIS gets 45 minutes warning. Um, compare the White House uh, Obama approach to fighting ISIS to that of Russia. While it took the US 15 months to begin targeting ISIS, oil refineries and tankers, airstrikes by Moscow destroyed more than 1,000 tankers in a period of just five days. In comparison, Colonel Steve Warren said that the US had taken out only 116 tanker trucks, the first strike um, to target ISIS, lucrative black market oil business, which funds over 50% of the terror group's activities. US airstrikes targeting ISIS oil assets are so rare that public service broadcasting um, in America was caught using footage of Russian fighter jets bombing an oil storage facility in Syria and passing it off as evidence of the US targeting the Islamic State's oil infrastructure. US military pilots have also confirmed that they were ordered not to drop 75% of the bombs on ISIS targets because they could not get clearance from their superiors. You went uh, 12 full months while ISIS was on the march without the US using that air power and now as, that, as the pilots come back to talk to us, they say three quarters of our ordnance we can't drop, we can't get clearance, even when we have a clear target in front of us, said Foreign uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Ed Royce, who retired, uh, while retired four-star U.S. General Jack Keane labelled the policy an absurdity from the beginning. But it's only an absurd, absurd, absurdity if your goal is to destroy ISIS, but it ain't. So, given that, it's not absurd. It's what you need to do. Leave them alone. Um, and uh, it says, uh, numerous analysts claim that the Obama White House is 15 months wait before it began targeting the primary funding mechanism behind ISIS was part of a policy to help Islamic State overthrow Syrian President Assad. Of course it was. Earlier this year, a document emerged confirming that the Pentagon foresaw the rise of ISIS and that Western support for al-Qaeda groups and other anti-Assad um, rebels in Syria would lead to the emergence of um, a Salafist principality that would help to isolate Assad. The bottom line, the most irrefutable truth, is that the US and its regional allies were all in on the use of sunny extremists to bring about regime change in Syria. Uh, and that was the strategy from the word go uh, and a direct result of the strategy that is ISIS said um, zero edge. Um, and uh, the US didn't want to cut off Islamic State's funding because without money the group couldn't fight Assad. We have the New York Times also reporting that US Central Command may have engaged in a year-long effort to deliberately conceal the fact that the United States plan to demolish ISIS was not effective, brackets on purpose. Evidence also continues to emerge that ISIS is receiving support from state sponsors of terror like Turkey and Saudi Arabia. $800 million worth of ISIS oil has been sold in Turkey, a US ally, 
ISIS trucks are routinely allowed to cross back and forth between the Islamic State stronghold of Raqqa and Turkey, while the NATO country facilitates black market oil sales on behalf of the terror group. Um, uh, documents that um, have come to light, a large cache of intelligence recovered uh, from a raid on an ISIS safe house this summer confirms that, quote, direct dealings between Turkish officials and ranking ISIS members was now undeniable. Which brings me to this, a WikiLeaks revelation this week. Hillary Clinton claims Saudi Arabia is the largest donor to Sunni terrorists worldwide. Of course, Sunni terrorists, ISIS. WikiLeaks has struck again. This time they have revealed a U.S. government cable sent from the former Secretary of State, uh, Hillary Clinton, to the Treasury Office that specifically alluded to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's substantial financial donations to international terrorist groups fighting the U.S. armed forces. I mean, it sounds ludicrous, and on the surface it is, if you think that America is actually trying to do what they say they're going to do. But when you realize what they're trying to do, it all makes sense while it's insanity if you see it from that other angle. According to this cable, quote, donors in Saudi Arabia constitute the most significant source of funding to Sunni terrorist groups worldwide. This is the same Saudi Arabia that um, is uh, causing catastrophe, death and suffering in Yemen without a um, glimmer of response from the uh, moral West and um, beheads people every few days. Um, Saudis use UK missiles on Yemeni civilian targets, says rights group. Here we have this moral um, Cameron wanting to go and bomb uh, in uh, Syria because of the moral crusade against um, terrorism. And here's the Saudis um, killing um, in Yemen using British weapons. Saudi Arabia used British made cruise missiles during an attack on a civilian Yemeni factory, say Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. Um, according to a report published by the Human Rights Group on Wednesday, um, remains of a PGM 500 missiles, or remains of a few of them, manufactured by the UK firm Marconi Dynamics, were found in the rubble of a factory that was targeted near the uh, capital in um, December, in September rather. The attack on uh, a factory in the uh, Sana government, um, which appeared to be producing only civilian goods, killed one person and was apparently in violation of international humanitarian law, as, as, as if the Saudis could give a damn about that. Um, and earlier this month, British Foreign Secretary Philip Hammond announced that weapons exports to Saudi Arabia would be halted. Investigations prove that Riyadh is breaching international humanitarian law during its ongoing aggression against Yemen. You bloody liar. Of course they know what's going on. <laughs> How much more do you want? Here you go. We'll, we'll send it to you. Go and kill some more people. Um, the latest revelations show UK policy to be both misleading and seriously ineffective. Um, despite multiple well-documented cases of violations of the laws of war by the Persian Gulf Coalition in Yemen, UK ministers have consistently refused to acknowledge this, said the director of Human Rights Watch, um, David Mepham. Well, you know, see above um, and uh, it's, it's interesting Yemeni sources say some 7,500 people have lost their lives in the Saudi attacks and the United Nations puts the death toll at uh, 5,700 including 830 women and children but when this is this is how it you know I, des I described the world once as like throwing um 50 balls of wool into a little room, putting 50 kittens in there, and then coming back a few hours later, and someone saying, sort out the mess. It's just, everything is um, so distorted, so full of ignorance. We live in a reality that is basically two worlds. There is the world populated, inhabited by the mass of the people. 
and then there is the world that is lived by those that are seeking to manipulate, control and oppress and suppress those people. And those worlds are just not the same. I don't mean that one group is fantastically wealthy compared with uh, the vast overwhelming majority of the rest. That's two worlds in itself. I'm talking about something uh, deeper. See, we um, are looking at a long planned, as I've been saying for so long, uh, conflict between the West and Russia with China brought in as well. It's been long planned and uh, the pieces are being moved into place more and more obviously. Now imagine the mentality that it takes to coldly plan and manipulate a conflict that will cause fantastic monumental death and destruction if it reached the level that they won. What would you need to do that? You would need a complete inability to feel compassion and to feel empathy with those you are going to kill, maim and make suffer. And yet, we have at least two precedents for it in World War I and World War II that were both, as my books and others have explained in detail, were both long planned and didn't break out by accident or random chance. And when you look at um, what is happening in the world now, in relation to this uh, massive uh, NATO build-up uh, against Russia and this demonization of Russia. And when you see in a, uh, a an excellent speech this week how uh, there seems to be just one mature world leader around, and that's Vladimir Putin, who was pointing out the ludicrous nature of what's happening because they have uh, absolutely no desire to invade anyone. And there is no evidence that that is the case. All we have is rhetoric and, um, and well, outright lies and propaganda from the leadership of the West. So here we have this obvious attempt to trigger a war with all the human and environmental consequences. What kind of mentality could possibly envisage that, let alone plan it and want it and seek to make it happen? Well, that brings us to Halloween. This is like Christmas. A great example of these two worlds that I'm talking about. To most people, uh, not least in the United States, but wider afield now, Halloween is a bit of fun. It's when uh, kids go around the doors, uh, trick and treating, and uh, they... Uh, dress up as ghosts and monsters and you have this apple bobbing and all this other stuff that goes on. And in the United States, it's become uh, the second most profitable festival uh, in the year, second only to Christmas in the amount of money that's generated. But Christmas and Halloween have a much deeper significance, and certainly so, to this hidden hand 
this other world of interbreeding bloodlines and their gophers that are manipulating world events and have been doing so for literally um, thousands of years. Christmas, for instance, is really Saturnalia. Saturnalia was a festival in ancient Rome, during the Roman Empire, in the run-up to what we now call Christmas. They gave uh, each other presents at this time. They decorated trees. They uh, hung um, holly, a, a sacred um, uh, plant tree, to um, Saturn. And Saturn was the great god of Rome, hence Saturnalia. This was a festival to the god Saturn. And like so many um, other pagan festivals, Christianity, when it came along, which of course came out of Rome, they uh, decided that they could uh, get new recruits easier. Uh, well, this is one reason for it. There are others. Um, if they just um, took over the pagan festivals and called them a different name. So eventually Saturnalia became uh, our Christmas and the, the, the alleged birth date of uh, Jesus Christ, who uh, is just uh, another uh, symbolic uh, figure uh, in a story that's been told over and over again throughout the ages and uh, endless different cultures, uh, each time just put into a, another historical setting with a, another name for the hero. But to this other world of these bloodlines and the world of Satanists, which these bloodlines are um, in their inner circle, uh, Christmas is still Saturnalia. It's still a time of human sacrifice. And uh, so Christmas is a time when the Satanists and these bloodlines do their rituals, including human sacrifice. And then, um, not least the sacrifice of children, by the way. And then we come to um, Halloween. This is the uh, ancient uh, Celtic and uh, Druid uh, Festival, Druid, of course, the priestly class of the Celts. Uh, and they had uh, a festival on uh, November the 1st called Samhain. And the night before uh, was uh, basically the, the Night of the Dead. And uh, they engaged once again in human sacrifice on uh, one heck of a scale. And then, of course, Christianity came along. And as with Christmas, it hijacked Samhain and called November the 1st All Saints Day. And the night before became known as uh, All Hallows. I've seen it some places as All Hallows Eve, which morphed into what we today call Halloween. And Halloween um, in the days of the Celts was a great time of human sacrifice. And of course, humanity reached a point where this was no longer acceptable, that you could not openly do these human sacrifices as part of your, your culture. But it didn't stop. When it became unacceptable to do it in the open, it went underground and has continued ever since in the networks of Satanism and the elite bloodline families who are actually the force in the end behind Satanism. Satanism, where they worship their unseen, malevolent, demonic, quote, gods. And they sacrifice to these gods. 
And, you know, we have this theme where the ancients used to sacrifice young virgins to the gods. Young virgins is just code, symbolism for children. And Halloween, while kids around, particularly the Western world, are engaging in trick-or-treating and uh, dressing up as ghosts and monsters. While they're doing that and having their fun in that side of Halloween, uh, in the shadows, phenomenal numbers of children are being sacrificed by these crazies, these psychopaths beyond words. And people might say, well, hold on, where are all the children come from? Well, if you perceive the number of children that go missing in the world every year by the number of missing children stories you see on the news, then you are massively beyond words missing the plot. Extraordinary numbers of children go missing worldwide every year. Never to be seen again, at least officially. Now, not all of those children end up with the Satanists, but a significant number do. And these are where the sacrifices come from. And uh, so often, um, a lot of these children are, are brought up in these cults specifically for sacrifice. And therefore, um, they operate in their own, their own bubble outside of mainstream society, often with the connivance of those in authority who connect into these satanic networks. And so a lot of children that are sacrificed uh, have never actually been um, officially registered as existing. They have um, people in these uh, satanic cults they call uh, breeders. Women call breeders who are held in captivity and give birth um, to children who are then sacrificed. Babies that are then sacrificed. Sometimes um, even fetuses that are aborted and then used in sacrifice. I think I mentioned earlier that there are two worlds in that reality. The one that most people perceive to be how things are. But there's another one that is so horrifically different to that, that those in the world of the general population will overwhelmingly say, that's rubbish, that, that's nonsense, that, that, that can't be happening. Because this other world is so dramatically, fundamentally, beyond words different to the world of the scene in general society that that chasm of difference is too much for most people to to breach in terms of their perceptions of uh, possibility and also connected to this um, whole uh, area of child abuse is this whole paedophilia um, horror which has come to light very much in England in recent years, but of course now that the lid's been put on that, oh my, we, we can't let them know this. Shut it up, shut it up. Um, because um, the same networks are involved in uh, the systematic sexual and violent abuse of children. It's all connected to this same network. This is why you have so many people in positions of power, politically and otherwise, who are both paedophiles and Satanists. So we have this um, period now coming up on Monday of um, Halloween. And to the Celts and the Druids, this was a time when the, the veil between this world and other worlds, the world of the dead, if you like, thinned 
and the dead could re-enter this world and people from this world could enter the world of the dead. Now, there's another big um, error that's made in terms of perceptions of how things are. And that is that knowledge can only move forward. That wherever we are at any point in what we call human evolution, it must be at the cutting edge of human knowledge. Not necessarily so. Okay, let's look at ancient Egypt. Now let's look at Egypt today. Uh, the very comparison between the two reveals that societies can um, go back in terms of where they are, as well as forward. And, and what is the key to that? It's knowledge. It's the circulation of knowledge, the circulation of understanding. Now, if you can systematically withdraw, suppress, which is what they've done massively through religion, not least Christianity, if you can withdraw and suppress knowledge so it goes out of general circulation, then that society is less knowledgeable, less evolved, if you like, in terms of awareness of reality than it was before. And there was knowledge circulating about the nature of reality in these ancient societies like, um, like the Celts and, and so many others all over the world that has been uh, withdrawn from human society. It's just starting to come back now. Um, and funnily enough, it's coming back into the form of things like quantum physics in, um, in our way of expressing it. But they knew, without using words like frequency and such like, these ancient societies, certainly the, 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 the key, key people within them that held this knowledge, they knew that this reality was only one of endless realities that shared the same space as this one, uh, like radio and television stations in the analog system share the same space without interfering with each other unless they're really close on the dial. And therefore they knew that interpenetrating this world were other realms, what we would now call bands of frequency, that had very different realities and they perceived them as the world of the dead which is kind of true in the sense that uh, when our consciousness leaves the body it goes to other frequencies of reality um, the body holds our attention in this frequency band we call visible light in the electromagnetic spectrum but when when our consciousness leaves the body then it doesn't have that focus and it expands into other realities so although there is no death apart from the, the body ceases to function uh, you can understand why these ancient societies like the Celts perceived um, these other realms as the realms of the dead and when um, planets and other heavenly bodies are moving around they are impacting upon the energetic field, the energetic sea that we're constantly interacting with, the electromagnetic field. And therefore they affect it. And it's therefore understandable again, from a modern perspective, how uh, certain times, i.e. states of the energetic field, would see it thin out in terms of its um, frequency difference between this reality and other realities. Uh, than, it, than it would be uh, normally in other parts of the year. And these Satanists and elite Satanic bloodlines understand this too. They just don't want us to understand it. And therefore, um, they can interact with their, quote, gods in other realms of the unseen more powerfully, more easily, um, at, at certain points than they can at others and this is where these major satanic festivals come from 
and Christianity has picked up almost all of it. In fact, um, many churches are actually built on former pagan sites where um, they understood that the world is interpenetrated by energetic lines of force, actually information, which people call ley lines and meridian lines, etc. And where many of these lines cross, um, fantastic uh, energetic vortexes are created, which, which also thin out the um, frequency difference between this world and other worlds. And if you put something on that spot, and you do your rituals on that spot, then you can interact with these other worlds more easily. And, uh, you know, the early uh, Christians um, were, um, were, were people that understood um, this, uh, were the, the people, be, uh, you know, driving it. Did. And churches were put on these pagan sites. And um, this is why, you know, so many uh, satanic uh, rituals go on in some of these churches, because they're on these points. So this is what um, Halloween is really all about in the shadows to those that understand um, what it really is and how reality really works. Now let's come back, therefore, to the build-up militarily against Russia with the plan to instigate a third world war of mass death and destruction. And let's come back to the mentality necessary to contemplate that, let alone plan it. What kind of mentality do you need to sacrifice little kids on satanic altars? and to do it on a mass scale. How totally and utterly deleted of empathy you would have to be to do that. How totally deleted of empathy and compassion you'd have to be to violently and sexually abuse a, a child. That is the mentality that's running our world. That is the mentality that has no problem with mass bombing Libya to save the civilians from violence, with instigating what happened in Libya, with instigating what happened in Syria, and invading Iraq on a lie, with instigating what has unfolded in Afghanistan. These are the people with a mentality absolutely uh, perfectly described by the sacrifices of Halloween and Christmas and Beltane and all these other festivals of sacrifice. This is the mentality that has absolutely no problem whatsoever with mass death and destruction. In fact, it gets off on it. It's what it wants so, when people say they would never do that, what they mean is this world that they inhabit, in their minds anyway, would never do that. This other world wants to do that, is doing that, has been doing it for thousands of years, and is continuing to do it today. And only by understanding this other world and the extreme psychopathic empathy deleted, compassion deleted mentality that operates there can we really understand the events of this other world that the rest of us inhabit. Halloween Christmas in their true sense to this network of Satanists and elite bloodlines are uh, times of extraordinary uh, suffering for their victims 
And there's a mass version of that. And we call it war. War is just, to these people, a massive, satanic um, time of mass bloodletting and mass death. And this um, mentality, this satanic cult that runs the world, is a death cult. And you can understand so many things in the world of the scene when you understand this other world that drives the world of the scene. This is a, <clears throat> a story from this week, wiped out and it's all our fault. <clears throat> Excuse me. Humans have wiped out so many animals that the planet is on the verge of the first mass extinction since the age of the dinosaurs, conservationists have warned. By the end of the decade, seven out of every ten of the world's mammals, fish, amphibians, reptiles and birds will have been wiped out, according to the biggest ever report into extinction. Why would there not be mass death in a world run by a death cult? Not just death of wildlife, but death of the, the environment, death of the forests and the rainforests, and of course, death on a vast scale of human beings, which has been happening uh, decade after decade all over the world, most notably in the two world wars so far. Now they want a third, and that is the mentality behind what is going on today. And we need to get streetwise to that. Because if people go on naively saying, oh, that can't be true, they'd never do that. They will do that. With the passage of world events, contrasted or compared with what people like me have been saying over the years is the plan to unfold, have brought um, extraordinary numbers of people compared with the past to look at the information and what they're saying in these increasingly large numbers is, well, this actually makes sense of world events far more than what the authorities are telling us. And this has reached a point where those very authorities, the form of politicians, and mainstream media and all these different aspects, um, have to start to see the challenge from the alternative media. And decide what they're going to do about it. And those decisions have been made clear in very recent times with the speech at the United Nations by the British Prime Minister David Cameron in which he uh, equated um, ISIS with non-violent uh, conspiracy theorists, basically. Um, on the face of it, the remark was idiocy, kind of idiocy with which people like Cameron have become obviously very well associated. But it wasn't that kind of idiocy, because there was a method in it, and that is to start to equate in the public mind people challenging the official lies, mendacity of government with supporting terrorism or creating the information environment in which people would turn to terrorism. And you can expect a lot more of this. These are just some of the opening shots. I'll get to what Cameron said as we go along. Um, and you can also expect um, more and more efforts to 
undermine, discredit, um, and altogether turn people against people like me and others, um, some of whom uh, have been putting this out for for decades now. And I guess the best example before Cameron's speech, this very recent, uh, in these very recent days, was what was said in a paper by one of what they call Obama's czars. This was a bloke a few years ago now called Cass Sunstein. And um, here's, a, here's a report of um, what he'd like to do in relation to the subject uh, we're talking about. Headline, Top Obama Czar Infiltrate All Conspiracy Theorists. Presidential advisor wrote about crackdown on expressing opinions. Um, and it was a, what, what's described here as a lengthy academic paper. And uh, Sunstein, the regulatory czar. Um, uh, does that mean he's regular? I don't know. Maybe. Um, and he argued that the US government should ban conspiracy theorizing. So you uh, are in, you are deeply in to the world of 1984 and uh, the whole Orwellian state uh, of uh, speech crime and thought crime. So he argued, and this is what this whole Cameron speech is about, and, and, and also the measures um, announced by the uh, Home Secretary uh, Theresa uh, May in, uh, at the Tory party conference this week. This is what they are leading to and seeking to introduce. So let's just go through a few of these things. Um, among the beliefs that Sunstein would ban is advocating that the theory of global warming is a deliberate fraud. Well, it clearly is. Um, and the evidence is overwhelming that it is, um, and it's uh, a, a uh, creation to justify the transformation of de de deindustrialization of global society, um, uh, uh, and to bring in something called Agenda 21. Uh, Google that if you're not aware of it, uh, it'll blow your mind. Um, Sunstein also recommended the government send agents to infiltrate, quote, extremists who supply conspiracy theories. See, this this is the way the perception deception works. You hijack the definition of words and terms. So um, the government, even though it's uh, terrorizing, bombing, slaughtering millions and millions of people in engineered wars and engineered uh, famines and all this other stuff, engineered terrorism. Despite all that, the government's is the reference point for morality and the reference point for moderation. No matter how extreme they are, they're the reference point of moderation. And so you have this uh, garbage that's trotted out by these people like Cameron and Obama, where they talk about American values. We're safeguarding American values. We are, we are uh, coming from a point of British values. Well, both America and Britain have been bombing the shit out of people um, throughout modern history. And, and it doesn't matter because they're the reference point. So the idea is that because they are that reference point of morality and balance and, and um, uh, peace and justice, that anyone that challenges them, exposes them for the liars, frauds and psychopaths that they are, is an extremist. Well, Big Brother moves on again this week, or more like Big Sister in Britain, in the form of uh, Home Secretary Theresa May, who has announced more anti-terrorism uh, measures. And you'll remember in the wake of 9-11 in uh, North America, Britain and other countries, a great swathe of anti-terrorism uh, legislation uh, came in, in which the definition of what was meant by terrorism, terrorists, terrorist activity, was so 
ill-defined and uh, so lacking detail in the definition of what the law was targeting that those uh, laws could be used across the uh, the society in general. And they were, and they have been. Uh, we have had some extraordinary examples of the way in uh, Britain that anti-terrorism legislation has been used to um, to keep surveillance on people and, and be used against people who are absolutely nothing to do with terrorism. I'll give you an example. Um, one local council used anti-terrorism legislation to keep surveillance on um, a couple to make sure that they did live in the catchment area of the school that applied for their child to attend. And this is what has been going on. And so when something comes out and someone makes a speech like Theresa May this week, and says, you know, these are new laws uh, against terrorism, terrorist activity, or this this new word now, the laws against extremism. Define extremism uh, uh, exactly. And so the the laws that they are bringing in, the new ones announced this week, are designed in just the same way. Uh, to be applied to the, the um, anti-terrorism legislation. And um, this is a newspaper report on Theresa May's stuff this week. Universities will have to ban hate preachers from speaking on campus under a crackdown unveiled yesterday by Theresa May. Once again, we're looking for definitions. What defines a uh, hate preacher? Some of it can be obvious. They're preaching hatred against people and, and, and preaching uh, violence against people and war against people. Yeah, you, can, you can see that. But unless it's absolutely defined, you can then start to uh, widen that. So governments say, well, this person exposing this politician or exposing this uh, scam uh, and conspiracy within government is preaching hatred against government, hatred against government ministers. And it could it could very easily be uh, be widened to do that, and, and is. I mean, the, the examples are there um, endlessly from previous uh, uh, legislation claiming to be against terrorism. Schools, colleges, prisons and councils will also be ordered to put in place anti-extremism policies. OK, define extremism. Again, well, you, you, can, you can define it in a small area, uh, although they don't, uh, but then you can widen it. Well, is someone who says 9-11 uh, was an inside job, are they extremists? Well, that's the idea, to move this and use this legislation to um, bring about a situation where that is precisely the case. So um, conspiracies uh, and exposing conspiracies, having an opinion about conspiracies, will eventually be considered extremism and thus banned. This is where it's leading and this is why we need to keep our eyes right on the ball with all this because it's very clear and there are past precedents, like I say, that, that show that this is just the foot in the door. It's not where it's meant to stay. Well, the term conspiracy theorist is being heard more and more these days, and there's a very good reason for that, because more and more the conspiracy